is free nature. Yes. Do you see what I said, Chris? I'm not talking about when you ask your partner to turn off the TV. <laughs> I'm talking about your otherwise well adjusted three year old having the world's biggest meltdown when you ask the your own iPhone back. Can I say I've been there as Karen said, I'm in the digital trenches with you. And I am trying to navigate this digital terrain, and I don't have a simple solution. If I did, I think we'd all be um, a lot happier, and we wouldn't have. Um, the other Karen and I were talking earlier, Karen nervously admitted that she's petrified about what I might share tonight. And I say from the outset, I'm not here to shield on you. As mums, I think we're, and, and dads, are constantly bombarded with the information about what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing. I'm here simply, my whole philosophy is that when you know better, you do better. It's a lovely saying by Mayo Angelo. And my aim is simply to arm you with evidence-based information about how technology is changing the ways young children learn, develop and play, and how we can leverage it to meet their developmental needs and minimise any potential harmful effects. So children today are leading digitalised, uh, sorry, digitalised childhoods. They learn to tap, swipe and pinch before they've learned to ride a bike, grip a pencil or tie their shoelaces. And on one hand, I think this excites us. We marvel, this is the digital dilemma we're facing. As parents, we marvel at what young children can do with technology. Whose child here can set up their smartphone without any problem? Who can program the DVD player without reading a manual? These are the children who have never seen a phone with a cord on it. They certainly will never have seen one of these. And these are children who never know the pleasure of waiting days and days and days for your Kodak film to get developed. <laughs> these children are leading completely digitalised childhoods and they're the complete antithesis to our childhood. Cookie has fond memories, swinging in the garden, running around, climbing, exploring. Your child's childhood is distinctly different, and this is one of the problems. So the flip side is of, of all this marvelling and being um, absolutely wowed by what children can do with technology is this deep-seated fear. I'm going to say I acknowledge completely, I'm petrified about what technology is not only doing to my children, but to me as well. And we're going to touch on that tonight. But whether you love it or loathe it, I hate to tell you, technology's here to stay. The iPad will not become uninvented, it's not going to disappear. Unfortunately, the media pick up on some of the negative reports and studies with technology and young children, and as time poor parents, we don't get to dive into the research. This is where I come in. I love, my husband tells everybody, my wife is a nerd, and that I am. I love the research, but I'm also a parent, and I apologise profusely if I'm a little incoherent. I was up for two and a half hours last night, as I'm sure many of you were, with a teething toddler and then was up at 3.30 this morning for an international conference call. So I'm experiencing a lot of the same challenges that you are, but I'm just going to, to ground the research with evidence-based information. Does anyone remember this? <laughs> what about this sound? And it, yes, it seems like a distant memory. And this is one of the problems with technology. People are often asking me, is technology really harming children's brains and bodies? I'm going to say, let's stop and pause about what technology is doing to us as adults. And we love labels, don't we, as parents? We love a label or a diagnosis. Who here suffers from phantom vibration syndrome? That physiological sensation that your phone's ringing and it's nowhere near your physical body? <laughs> Who are the two biggest sufferers in our society? And we're hoping not preschoolers yet. Middle-aged men and teenage girls. Why? Their phone is physiologically on their body. Now we're going to get into the health ramifications of that later on. Big no-no. Big, big nowhere. No-no. And we'll, we'll talk about the potential harmful effects of electromagnetic radiation. But this is evidence. Technology is literally rewiring our brain architecture as adults. Let's think about the young developing brains that we're working with. Is technology changing their brains and their bodies? Absolutely. But like I said, it's here to stay. So what we have to do is figure out how do we leverage this in developmentally appropriate ways? How can we use technologies in ways that is healthy and helpful, but at the same time, how can we mitigate? How can we minimise some of the potential harmful effects? Okay, cast your mind back to your childhood. You're going to figure out very quickly what era I was born in. Do these look familiar to any of you? 
I was an 80s kid. Now, we have this notion that we grew up roaming the neighbourhoods and we didn't use any technology. I was a 1970s child. I used technology, but the technology wasn't omnipresent. We didn't carry these technologies, very rarely, in our mum's handbags. They weren't being used. What we're seeing now is a phenomenon called the pass-back effect, where parents are literally passing over their digital device to entertain, to pacify, or sometimes to educate. Now, one of the reasons that we're absolutely bamboozled as parents is the technology is evolving rapidly. And in the research field, we have something called the penetration rate. And the penetration rate basically looks at how long it takes the technology to penetrate to 50 million users. So the radio, the real wireless, took 38 years. TV took 13 years. The internet took four years. Facebook took two years. YouTube took one year. You see where I'm going? How long did it take angry birds to reach penetration rate? Lower? 35 days. So this is why you're bamboozled. The technology is growing exponentially. And just when you get a handle on the technology that your child's fascinated with this week, what happens? Along comes something else to supersede it. So as parents, we're facing this constant digital dilemma. The technology is evolving. The media headlines demonise technology. And coupled with this, there's this deeply entrenched philosophical belief in early childhood that technology is toxic and taboo. Children shouldn't be spending time with screens. They should be spending time in the sandpit. Children shouldn't be staring at screens. They should be staring at the sky. And I completely agree with those sentiments that we do need a balanced approach. It's not about technology superseding what children need. And hopefully tonight... I can explain and ground it in the research. What is it that developing brains and bodies need to thrive, not survive, but to thrive in this digital age? And you might be pleased, pleasantly surprised. I promise Karen I'm really going to try to allay some of her, I call it techno guilt, who he feels that, the pangs of guilt when you hand over your iPad, when you wrestle with the remote control from your child to turn off the TV. Yes, I promise Karen that, remember, I'm not going to shoot on you, but I'm also hoping that what I can do tonight is to allay some of your fears. There's no need. I think as parents we second-guess everything and feel guilty about so many things. I don't want technology to be another one of those things that you need to, to worry about. So I'm hoping to debunk some of the very popular myths, misconceptions and misnomers about young children and technology. Does, sorry, does this look familiar? <laughs> I need you to look more excited. Pan, up, down. But you're blocking me. You're blocking me. You are a boss. Ready? Three, two. That's a good one. You don't look great in that one, but the filter makes everybody look great. <laughs> Caption. Now we wait. Cutie pies. That's us. 65 likes and 22 shares in less than 45 minutes. So this is one of the many dilemmas facing parents today and if you haven't come across this term recently, I shared a blog post and I've already had about eight emails, I shared it at lunchtime this morning, I've had eight emails that were very unpleasant talking about this, it's a very obviously contentious issue. Brexting is one of the many modern parents' dilemmas. Do we, is it okay to breastfeed and use your phone simultaneously? Hence the term Brexting. Um, and we'll unpack that idea. Some of the other digital dilemmas facing parents in that particular video, there's another phenomenon called sharenting, oversharing our parenting milestones on social media. Now, whilst it can look innocent in that instance, the father taking photos with his son, what long-term habits are we setting up for our children when we're teaching them you need external validation? The number of likes you get validates what you look like or your appearance. We're also curating our children's digital footprint. And I know this is an issue facing a lot of playgroups. Is there permission to post? Is it okay to post images of other people's children on Facebook pages? We're also seeing another phenomenon called FOMO. And this isn't what teenage girls suffer, fear of missing out. That's why a lot of them are sleeping with their phone adjacent to their bed or underneath their pillow or walking around with it in their bra strap constantly. FOMO for parents is a term that's been coined to describe fear of missing, sorry, fear of making memories. Who really struggles to not take their phone when you go to a special occasion, a school assembly, a performance? At my son's graduation ceremony last year, I sat up the back, because I had a, an 18-month-old at the time, 
and I watched the performance, his Christmas Carol performance, through the lens of a series of video camera shots. Um, so we have to be really mindful, and I'm not anti-technology, I love technology, but what we need to do is make sure that we're using it in the right ways. And a lot of the time we focus on how children are using technology, correct? We worry about their screen time, we worry about what apps they're using. We have to also pause and think about how we're we using technology. What powerful messages are children picking up on? We all know that children emulate all of our worst behaviours, or depending on what the behaviour is, our parents, uh, sorry, our partner's particular behavioural traits. And let me tell you neuroscientifically why. Are you all aware of the discovery of something called mirror neurons? Mirror neurons basically explain why children emulate. Why do they copy? And these are a series of nerves that run along the motor nerves in the brain. This is why infants as young as 15 minutes of age, 15 minutes of age will poke their tongue out to a researcher. It's not the rooting reflex. It's not them trying to feed. This is after they have been fed. If a researcher pokes the tongue out to a fifth baby as young as 15 minutes, they copy. Why? Because of these mirror neurons. So our technology habits are being observed. And this is why we do have toddlers trying to tap at smartphones as well. So Brexting techno tantrums. I'm going to tell you neurologically why your otherwise well-adjusted child, you may be past the two-year-old terror stage and you could have an eight-year-old. I was working in a, a school recently where I saw a 12-year-old girl having a real techno tantrum because she was asked to flick her iPad off. I'm going to tell you neurologically why, and can I say if this is the exact same reason why, and you don't need to raise your hand, who feels compelled to check Facebook one last time before you go to sleep? Or very quickly, perhaps it's email, perhaps it's first thing in the morning. Let me explain why, and you'll understand why children are also having techno tantrums. Whenever you do anything pleasurable in life, whether it's looking at funny things on Facebook, or eating chocolate, or laughing, your brain releases the neurotransmitter, dopamine. What does dopamine do? makes you feel good. What do you want? More and more of it. So when your child is playing Minecraft or if they're younger, they're playing an app, they're creating something, they're watching a clip on YouTube, what is their brain releasing? Little squirts of dopamine. What do they want? More and more of it. There's no simple solution to avoiding the techno tantrum. I wish there was. Somebody asked me the other day, is there an app to avoid the techno tantrum? <laughs> There's not. It's called having really strong parameters. Children need, and we're going to talk about screen time limits tonight, but children need strong parameters, strong boundaries around their technology use. So what is the impact of screens? Can I say as a researcher I'm going to openly declare we're really slow at keeping up to date with the technology? Remember that it's growing exponentially and researchers are terrible at waiting. There's a real lag between getting your research published. By the time it's published, the technology is being superseded by something else. So I openly admit that we are conducting a bit of a living experiment. Do we yet know the long-term impacts of Wi-Fi, electromagnetic radiation? Yet we sit in environments and often put our children in environments where they are constantly exposed to electromagnetic radiation. Do we know the long-term impact on children's vision development if they're spending increasing and earlier amounts of time with screens? We don't yet have a lot of longitudinal evidence, but what we do have, and this is what I do, I take the de developmental science research, I take a bit of the neuroscience research, and we have a really clear idea about what children need neurologically and developmentally to learn and develop. What I then do is pull in the technology research. What do we know about television and iPads and screen time? How do those three pieces fit together? Um, so what we need to do is make sure, again, how do we use the technology in ways that won't derail their development? <laughs> Familiar? Now what I want to do now, as a, as a former teacher, I love doing quizzes. So I'm going to do a little quiz, there's no marks, but just I want to dispel some of the myths, misnomers and misconceptions about young children and technology to help ease that techno guilt. Please remember Maya Angelou's saying, when you know better, you do better. Can I tell you, I was a researcher in this field for a long time. I then experienced life's greatest equaliser. Becoming a parent, all the theory in the world goes out the window. And can I say, I'm not perfect in all of these. So please don't fret, don't think, oh my goodness, I've mucked my child up. True or false? True. True. In the 1970s, the average age that children were introduced to technology was four years of age, and most often it was play school or secondary <coughs> street. 
Fast forward to 2010, what's the average age that children are introduced to technology? Four months. Four months of age and obviously because of the prevalence of touchscreen technologies. So what's the, is this a problem? Is it toxic and taboo? The big thing when we think about technology, particularly with young children and very young children, is that when children are using a screen, there's an opportunity cost. They're not doing something else. Screen time is displacing other opportunities. So if the technology, if the screen time is being used in developmentally appropriate and in intentional ways, it's carefully selected, then it can be a really valuable learning experience. But if it's used excessively, or if it's used inappropriately, can you see how it can potentially derail a child's development? Next one. So you can get a pat on the back. Absolutely, and this is one of the biggest myths that I want to debunk, that TV is a waste of time or that it's harmful. TV, and we've got a significant corpus of research, particularly we've got over 40 years of research on Sesame Street, and overwhelmingly the research tells us that quality educational programs can enhance children's learning, particularly children from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. Does that mean all TV shows are created equal? Absolutely not. And I'm going to tell you what you should be looking for. I use that word should. The ideal types of things that make TV educational. True or false? This is one that's in the media a lot. True or false? I'm hearing mixed information. It's actually false. The research at the moment definitely tells us that children with attentional issues tend to have more screen time. But is it the chicken or the egg? We don't have any research yet that proves causation. We've got research that shows correlation. So at the moment, yes, children that do have attentional issues tend to use more screens, but is it because the rapid-fire, fast-paced action that often comes with screens stimulates their brains? Or is it the screen time that's causing that? In false... Can I tell you, this was the reason for the, this was the whole genesis of my business. I was in my mother's group, I was a tech, happy technology researcher, didn't have to deal with the practicalities and then became a mum and all the girls in my mother's group were saying, what baby Einstein DVDs are you using? I had my child healthcare nurse asking me what apps I was using with my then six month old. She didn't know what I did for work. Um, and hugely concerning. There has been a whole baby development industry. I walked into our local traditional toy shop the other day and the first thing that you see in the toy shop now are techno toys for young babies. Parents are under increasing pressure to buy these types of products to accelerate children's learning and development. This industry, in fact, Baby Einstein is owned by Disney. Disney were fined $26 million back in 2010 for false and misleading claims. Their packaging claimed that the Baby Einstein DVDs would accelerate your baby's language development and boost your child's brain development as well, not founded in research. In fact, the research tells us the opposite. If children spend excessive amounts of time and please don't fret, I know lots of us have used these DVDs. It doesn't mean you've harmed your child's development, but don't be duped into thinking that it's accelerating your child for Harvard. It's not. So a big false one. Closely related to this, and this is quite an interesting one, the whole baby Mozart industry was actually born out of research that looked at tertiary students, so not even babies, the tertiary students' spatial reasoning skills. And what they did was play 10 minutes of classical music be before these university students did some spatial reasoning tasks, and then they did a post-test, and what did they find? The group that listened to Mo Mozart outperformed the group that didn't. They then extrapolated the findings from that research, and a whole baby Mozart industry was born. These are the types of neuromyths that parents are fed to buy products. Doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's boosting your child's development. This was a headline. I had a whole lot of parents contact me. This was published on The Guardian in late 2014. You could imagine, and it said, it, the initial headline said, research proves iPads and smartphones damage brains, children's brains. The research that they were, were alluding to was not an academic paper. It was a position statement from a psychologist who thought, um, again, not substantiated by the research, um, and this is one of the, the problems for parents is that we are bombarded with conflicting advice. We're told introduce screens early, no don't use screens. Um, so what we need to do is dispel the myths. 
There's a lot of politicians in the US still arguing over this one. True or false? True. Particularly boys. Boys are so much more vulnerable to the adverse effects of violent video game content. One, we know neurologically their brains are wired differently to girls. Um, we've got a great research study not looking at violent video games but looking at violent television shows and a group of preschoolers were shown a video. Has anyone seen this study? It's a great little video. A group of half the children um, were shown a Teletubbies clip and then they watched the children's play afterwards and then another group of children were shown a Power Rangers clip and then they watched their play afterwards. What was a really significant observation? Aggressive play, violent play after the children had watched a particular type of show. Um, so boys are particularly vulnerable. The other thing I want to touch on here is that the graphics in video games these days are so much more sophisticated. I often hear parents say, I watched Roadrunner and I grew up okay. I didn't become an axe murderer. <laughs> Roadrunner's graphics were nowhere near as sophisticated and realistic as what they are now. And we'll come back to that. I just want to flag an idea here. What children watch and when they watch it, I'll touch this one in a minute, is so much more important than just how much they're watching. What and when versus how much, and we'll talk about that. Oops, I gave you the answer. <laughs> really scary. Children are forming a concept image of the ideal body as young as five years, and it's not just girls, boys in particular. Young boys are forming a notion of an ideal body because they're bombarded with images. We actually know the part of the brain that's responsible for processing visual information, the visual cortex, is now actually physi physiologically bigger in children than what it was 10 years ago. Why? They're processing so much more visual information. Can I add in brackets here and adults? <laughs> we all know. Okay, I'm going to very quickly talk about... No, I'll come back to this later on. Um, overwhelming evidence, and in fact a psychologist in the US is saying that we have a chronic problem with sleep with children and that we perhaps have a whole generation of children that are misdiagnosed with attentional issues when in actual fact they are chronically sleep deprived. And I'm going to talk about sleep quotas and what we can do in this digital age. Basically, screen time in the 90 minutes before children fall to sleep, whether it's a nap in the day or a sleep at night, is really detrimental. And I'll come back and unpack that idea later on. Oh, I gave you the answer again. The, as some of you would have seen in the media in the last couple of weeks, in recent weeks, the American Academy of Pediatrics have updated their very outdated screen time guidelines. Um, previously, we were told what were the guidelines for 0 to 2 year olds here in Australia. We basically emulated the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is where no one wants to answer. Zero for 0 to 2 year olds. So no, stay with me, this is where I lose you all. You think, oh, I've failed as a parent. No, no, no. These are, I'm going to tell you, I don't agree with these guidelines. So listen. So no, no screen time for zero to two-year-olds. How much screen time for two to five-year-olds? One hour a day. And for five years and above? Two hours. Two hours a day. Can I say a recent study from Western Australia found that 80% of Australian families don't adhere to these. So breathe a collective sigh of relief. You're not a bad parent if you don't adhere to these guidelines. My big problem with the screen time guidelines is that they narrowly focus in on how much. If we're focusing on how much, we're missing all the other really important questions. What are they doing? What are they watching? What are they creating? Is it age appropriate? Um, is it scary content? Are they creating or are they consuming? When are they using the technology? Is it before sleep? The other really important time, is it before school? Rapid fire, fast paced cartoons and video games are the worst thing you can do for your child before school. What do we do? We stimulate their brains and then we expect them to sit on Mrs Smith's carpet and listen to Mrs Smith read a book. The complete <laughs> opposite ends of the brain that they need to use. Um, so screen time guidelines are really misleading and I actually think they lull parents into a false sense of security because all of a sudden I say, oh, I'm a good parent. They've only had an hour of, of, of YouTube today, but that hour of YouTube could have been really inappropriate content. So time as a metric is really not the most appropriate thing to focus on. And there were those screen time guidelines to freak you out um, and then to say you don't necessarily need to adhere to them. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that as I mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I've got a detailed blog post, the American Academy of Pediatrics are no longer specifying 
screen time recommendations. Instead, they're recommending that parents look at what, when and with whom. A really critical factor with technology is who are children playing the iPad with? Who are they watching television with? I'm going to talk about this later on, but co-viewing is hugely beneficial for children, whether they're watching a video game or a TV show. <laughs> Think mirror neurons, yes or no? We know the answer to this one. And can you believe it or not, this is in the pile of research that really didn't need to be done, but they got funding for it. <laughs> they did a study and found very close relationships between high families, high media users with parents and high media users with children. So no surprises there. Poor dad. Yeah, just give me a minute here. I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta get this thing. How was the birthday party? You have to send me some pictures. How was your week at school? Now, I coined this term, and it's been probably one of the most contentious. Again, I get a lot of hate mail when I publish these sorts of posts, but I feel that it's important to know. Um, I coined the term technoglect, and we're seeing research. Psychologists are seeing this phenomenon. Um, a study by the technology company AVG surveyed Australian children, and 32% of Australian children felt that their parents spent more time with their screens than they did with them. So our children are observing this. In another study in the US, there were some 12-year-olds that were taken on an app camp, and the children were able to create any sort of app that they wanted. What did a significant proportion of the... And there were hundreds of children at this app camp. What did a significant proportion of these children want to create? An app that controlled their parents' smartphones and technology. Really scary that children are seeing and observing this. Now, I'm the first to not do something called techno-shaming. We've all seen the mummy blogs and the social media posts where we shame people for using technology. This is not about making you feel bad about using technology around your children. I run an online business. It often means I have to take a phone call or quickly respond to something. But what we have to be really mindful of is are we doing it all the time? What's the opportunity cost when I'm looking at my screen as opposed to interacting with my child? Um, and it's not just um, what they're missing out on. It's the habits that they're forming. A study that was published in the Journal of Paediatrics last year actually confirmed this. It was an ethnographic study, and what they did was observe 55 families in a food court, so a very naturalistic setting. Of the 55 parents who were unaware they were being observed, what proportion of the parents pulled out their smartphone during the meal in the food court? 44 of those parents. And what they noticed was that the children's behaviour usually tended to be attention-seeking behaviour, or inappropriate behaviour. Basically, the children were vying for their parents' attention, and in one instance, a parent was seen kicking their child under the, the table because they were frustrated that they couldn't use their, their device securely. OK, this is a topic I get asked about all the time, and if you saw the 60 Minutes episode a few weeks ago, you probably would have been led to believe that your children, your preschoolers, are addicted. I firmly believe that... Uh, very, very few number of young children under eight are addicted to technology. I don't doubt for a second they form strong attachments to technology. They definitely do, and sometimes they can fall, um, form an unhealthy dependence <coughs> on technology. This is where we see the smartphone being used as the digital pacifier. You all know what we're talking about. But that doesn't mean they're addicted. Addicted behaviours come with a whole range of other behaviours, but most importantly, if you're addicted to something, you make a conscious choice to do something, even when you know there are going to be adverse consequences. So alcoholics will still choose to drink, even when they know there are likely to be dire consequences. Children don't yet have the long-term hindsight skills and the emotional skills to make <coughs> these sorts of choices. Their self-regulation hasn't developed. It's a still a work in progress. So very reluctant to use the word addicted, definitely attached. In fact, a lot of us are attached to our devices too. In, we've got a name for it because we all like names as parents and labels. Nomophobia, fear of not having your phone. Who would travel to work knowing that you left your phone on the kitchen countertop? Some of us would. Some of us, that would cause great anxiety. So tonight I want to just quickly go over some of the asset, facets of raising kids in this digital age. I've talked about a lot of them. Um, then I'm going to tell you what are the seven simple things, and this will hopefully allay some of your fears. 
what do, then this is grounded in the neuroscience and the developmental science, what do kids need, what are the seven essential building blocks to thrive in a digital age and how does technology intersect with these and then hopefully we get some time for some digital health. So how is technology impacting eyesight, posture, Wi-Fi and hearing? So we've talked about the fact that children today are experiencing these digitalised childhoods. And as I said to, uh, earlier, the internet's not going to become unplugged. The iPad won't become uninvented. So we have to find the best ways to use it. What's wrong with this photo? No one can reach the food. Who gets a tray like that of really nice food unless you're staying in a hotel? And in which case you wouldn't be all sitting there. Now, this might concern you. This is not, the iPoddy is a legitimate product and it is not a prototype. I contacted the US manufacturers and they misconstrued my email. They thought I was inquiring about becoming an Australian distributor, to which I replied no. As a parent, my big issue is touch screen and toilet training, just a diabolical combination. But what's really concerning is this part of this marketing pressure that parents are under. Hothouse your child, accelerate them dunk them into the digital stream early on to boost their IQ and to get them ready for this digital world. This is not developmentally appropriate. This is not what young children need. I'm doing it, I'm doing it. What? I'm really proud of you, buddy. You did great. We, I missed it on here. I need to recreate the whole thing. If I can't share it, it's like it didn't happen. Do you understand? Okay. So this is that idea of FOMO, fear of making memories. So a simple thing, a simple tip that we can do, and I'll tell you a little anecdote here, I failed at that. When my second son started to take his very tentative first steps, I quickly grabbed the phone and of course he fell over, so I got the phone out again and then he took a few more and I was videoing the recreated first steps. The four-year-old in the background says, because I was recording, say, oh look, Billy's taking his first steps. The four-year-old interjects and says, he walked before mum, what are you talking about? <laughs> Sent it to my husband and had to explain they weren't technically his first steps. But So I'm not perfect at this, but this whole idea of are we so afraid of making a memory that we don't actually, that we think we need to digitally capture it. Capture things to, to, to your own hard drive first and foremost. Don't miss the moment because you're so busy trying to digitally capture it. Just pick some times or pick five minutes. You have your phone and then your phone goes away. Go to the park and leave your phone in the car. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't touch. This is a, another product. It has been withdrawn from Fisher and Price's um, range. It had over 200,000 parents sign a petition objecting to this product. Now, not only is it concerning for their vision um, and the fact that we would put a six to nine month old in one of these devices, but the marketing claims on this product is what really worried me. They claimed that you could boost your six to nine month old's language numeracy skills and shape recognition by using this particular, it was called the activity seat. Oh, no. So parents, we're worried, remember some of the reasons why we also confuse, the technology is changing exponentially, we get conflicting misguided advice and we also have no frame of reference. When we grew up, what was the only technology that our parents had to wrangle with us? TV and it was screwed to one wall in the house. It didn't get smuggled into pyjama pants. It wasn't in your mum's handbag at the, at the restaurant. So you are facing a tsunami of screens. Kids are growing up in a smorgasbord of technology and it's really hard to make informed choices. <coughs> Hence, we're all riddled with techno guilt. And when people ask me, you know, the mummy conversations you have at the park on the swings, I tend to have the best because the kids aren't doing a million things and interrupting you. Whenever parents often ask, what do you do for research or what do you do for work, and I tell them, you can sort of or see them always pulling away, like, what's she going to tell me? And I, when I explain that technology isn't toxic or taboo, that it, if we use it the right way, it can actually be fine for children. In fact, it can help them. There's almost this collective sigh, oh, you know, I'm not such a bad parent. There's so much techno-shaming and guilt around using technology. Um, and there shouldn't be. We need to have discussions like this and open conversations rather than saying, oh, my child never uses technology or my child never watches TV um, or plays on the iPad, having open conversations about what's the best way to use them in ways that match their developmental needs because we don't want this. And this is the digital apocalypse that we could be facing if we don't teach our children how to use technology. If we ignore it or ban it or fear it with young children, 
once they eventually get that device in their hand, what are they going to do? Become immersed with it. So our job is just to teach them healthy, helpful ways to use it. Now what's really concerning from a neuroscientific perspective, and I'm sure you all know this, but 90% of brain architecture occurs before the age of five. So you are literally a brain architect sculpting your child's brain development in those early years. So this is why we have to be really careful about screen time. Neuroscientifically, I'll give you neuroscience in one minute here. Basically what, how the brain develops is in the posterior part of the brain. The brain stem, this is the more primitive part of the brain. This part of the brain is responsible for movement and sensory processing. So this is why early on we have the startle reflex, why children want to suck, touch, crawl, move around. Then by around ages three to four, the brain starts to come online here in the prefrontal cortex. And your prefrontal cortex is the CEO of your brain. It's basically the air traffic control system. And three really important things take place in this prefrontal cortex. Number one, it's where your child's impulse control takes place. Can I tell you, this part of the brain, let me tell you the other two parts before I forget. So impulse control, working memory, and mental flexibility, being able to problem solve and think. This part of the brain is the last part of the brain to come online. It doesn't develop until early 20s for females and late 20s for males. This is why males are disproportionately represented in fatal car accidents. Why? Their impulse centre has not come online, literally. So when it's not a myth. Um, men, you get your revenge later on because there's part of the information that women have got wrong for years. Um, so really important. Now, if we are bombarding children in a digital world where there's sensory overload, can you see how this primitive part of the brain can get overstimulated? This is why a lot of children would prefer to look at a screen now than look at nature and immerse themselves in nature. They're getting sensory bombardment or sensory seduction all the time. This is also why we need to be concerned because this prefrontal cortex, the impulse control, our working memory, we have something called the Google effect. Who here can remember more than three phone numbers at the moment? Who here can remember really good factual information like you could when you were at school? We don't. We're doing something called cognitive offloading. We're offloading some of our memory-making capacity to technology, and so are our kids. I travel throughout Australia, and teachers throughout the country, it doesn't matter where I go, lament the fact that kids today do not know their timetables like they used to. Why? Their working memory skills have diminished. So we just need to be really careful. Again, not saying don't use technology, but we have to be really careful about what the opportunity costs. So what are the seven things? So I'm going to tell you that this is grounded in the neuroscience and the developmental science and overwhelmingly it tells us, you can hear your mother's voice here, I always hear my mother's voice. I've just pub I have written a book that's with a publisher and I was, when I was writing this particular part of the book I could hear my mum's voice the whole time. It really is the simple things that kids need. They're calling it, the research is calling it ancestral parenting. Kids need really basic things for optimal development, even in this digital age. So what do developing brains need? Developing brains need these simple things. They need exposure to language. We all knew that, and I bet you're all doing lots of that. They need to move. They need to physically explore. They need sleep. They need opportunities to play. They need to form relationships and attachments. They need executive function skills. These are the skills that take pl place in that prefrontal cortex. And they need good nutrition. Can I tell you that technology is affecting both positively and negatively each of those seven building blocks? Technology can either support or it can stifle each of those, depending on how it's used. So I've come up with this idea of a jar. And I've brought my jar along here. And within that jar, these are the seven building blocks. Now we can see technology either as making each of these balls bigger and expanding the jar, or we can see technology as shrinking each of these, adversely impacting them. Or we can look at it, and this is how we can start to reconceptualize screen time. We can say, well, these are the seven essential things that kids need to thrive. They need to play, move, eat good food, hear language. Let's put all of these in the jar first and foremost. Then, any of the white space that's left around, we can fill up with screen time. I'm going to unpack this idea a little bit more as we go. I love this analogy. So true. Your job as the gardener is to match the right technology to your child's particular needs. 
So first and foremost, the first building block is language. Children need to hear and use as much language as possible in the early years. We've got a very well-known study that looks at children from socioeconomically advantaged backgrounds and disadvantaged backgrounds. By 36 months of age, there is how many million word gap between the rich and the poor? About 30 million. And the gap gets wider and wider. So children need to be immersed in as much language as possible because we don't want this happening. And when I, I, when I t this happened with my second son when we went to the child health care nurse, she didn't know what I did for work and I was so sleep deprived at my six month, or six month check um, that I really couldn't form a coherent response when she asked me what apps I was using with my six month old. When I went home and later digested it and got this calming six, sorry, calmed the six month old down, I wrote a really honest blog post about it and came up with this image um, and it went viral. This is Billy um, at six months of age and I said babies need laps, not apps. Really, really important, particularly with under two-year-olds, that there's no rush to introduce technology. We've got overwhelming research with technology that tells us that children find it much harder, young children up to around even 36 months of age, but definitely with under twos, it takes young children under the age of two almost two and a half times longer to learn something from a screen than from a real life interaction or re using real objects. There is no value add in dunking young children under two into the digital stream. Doesn't mean they shouldn't use technology or they can't, but don't be lulled into this false belief that you're accelerating their development. Um, we have to be really mindful with language. What are they missing out on when they're using a screen? But let's spin it around. Let's look at the positive potential. Who uses Skype to communicate with family members or with fam uh, partners that travel for work? We've got lots of evidence come being published that tells us that Skype is brilliant for not only building language skills, but for building authentic relationships. This was Grandma Jones, who was 95, and she used to have weekly calls with my son, Skype calls, where they'd sing nursery rhymes and songs and she'd read books to Taj. I took a screenshot of this and I, because Grandma Jones got on Skype at the ripe old age of about 93. She then said to me, Christy, could you send me, text me, flick me a text, she used those words, flick me a text with the photo. I just want to check it's okay before you use it. I flicked her the text. I got about eight texts telling me that she'd received the, the image and that she'd respond in email. Grandma Jones said she was happy for me to share this image so long as I acknowledged whenever I shared it that she didn't know she was going to be screenshot, otherwise she would have had her hair set and put her lipstick on. <laughs> so I'm apologising on behalf of Grandma Jones, but this is a really positive potential. This is where technology can boost language skills. Um, if you're interested in reading more about Skype, I've got a blog post with lots of practical tips about how you can get the most out of Skype time because expecting your five-year-old or your four-year-old to sit there and talk for long periods of time will not work, um, but you can use it positively. We've also got lots of technologies and interactive technologies like touchscreen devices provide really unique opportunities not only for children to consume content. Historically, what has technology offered young children? Lots of passive use of technology. Sit there and watch TV and videos. But now we're giving very young children. I work. I used to work a lot in primary schools, helping them navigate technology. The bulk of my work now is in early childhood centres, helping them to use technologies in the right ways. And we've got really powerful tools where young children can create content like this. I'm a moose. I live in the snow. Snow. When I get out of work and, and I have a big squishy thing and I have a t and some big horns and, and some stuff and I have a little a big bowl and I'm a little bit brown except for these bits and these bits and I have some bits, two bits here, two bits here. Can you see we're giving kids really powerful tools to practice language, to hear it back, that metacognition, reflecting on what they're learning and practicing. Kids, unlike adults, love hearing their own voice. Um, who takes lots of digital photos with the best intentions to print them out but you never do? The family holiday, the new pet, something exciting happening in your family? Use apps like this together. This was my son when he went to visit Nanny's um, school. They had the fire truck. We took a whole lot of photos that night instead of a book. We put the photos together. 
He didn't type that. Someone asked me. He was 18 months. He wasn't typing that. I typed the text. But what we did do is he recorded his voice. Now, he still reads this book back because he loves hearing his funny voice at 18 months because this was the wed fire twuck at nanny's school. Can you see that's a really powerful way to document our kids' learning but also to get them to practice? The witch came in the princess's castle to and her said, Now I now I'm gonna take you, princess, and now I'm gonna put you in my witch's jail. But oh, the, no, the, no. Witch, the witch didn't see the prince hiding in the doorway. The, the prince came to scare the witch. What's most impressive is not the fact that they're three, but that took those group of children about 40 minutes. The video goes on for a fair bit longer, but it took those children 40 minutes from woe to go to create a digital story with their voice and the animations and the background music. That's using a, an app called Toontastic. Um, so can you see there's lots of positive potential what we want to do, particularly with touchscreen devices, is we don't want young children spending too much time consuming content. Not too much time watching television and YouTube. A little bit is fine. I'm not saying don't ever do it. What we want to do is give children powerful tools to create. Because can you see when they're creating, they're using all their higher order thinking skills. They're using language. They're problem solving. They're deeply engaged. So if we do want children to consume content, we've got to find appropriate content. And Nosy Crow is an app developing company in the UK and they have transformed all of the traditional fairy tales into the most wonderful interactive book apps. Now this particular book app is incredible. And this is what we, and I'm not saying we replace the traditional book experience. Kids still need to read real books. But with book apps can offer new ways to learn. So in this particular app, Jack is stuck in the giant's castle and he accidentally knocks over one of the mirrors in this room. In order for Jake, Jack to escape the castle, he has to reconstruct the mirror that shattered on, is shattered on the floor. The mirror uses your iPad's built-in camera so that when your child is trying to put the jigsaw puzzle of the mirror back together, whose face is in the jigsaw puzzle? Theirs. Your child is now in the giant's castle helping Jack escape. That's just one of the many scenes in this book. So there's totally different ways for children to practice language. This is another brilliant app, and it's they've, um, another app that's very similar. Kindoma is one. Another app is called Quality Time that does exactly the same thing. It's basically a storybook app with pop-up video chat windows. So my mum used this with her grandson that lives in a very remote part of North Canada. In real time, they were reading the same book and they were video chatting so they could see each other's faces. My mum could zoom in on the wolf's snout and ask particular questions. Book apps like this is one of, one of the few apps where we have an Australian narrator. We don't want our children growing up with American accents. Um, using this particular <coughs> app as well, you can press record and you, who travels for work or has partners travel for work, you can digitally be there for the book experience. You can narrate the story and have it read back to them or your child can practice being the narrator. So how do you keep on top of finding apps? Believe it or not, there are apps for finding apps because of course there are. The two I recommend for parents, Kinder Town is maintained by um, educators of zero to eight year olds. So highly recommend this app. It's an app that just reviews apps. Kids Media is a free app for parents of children <coughs> aged 0 to 18 years. And not only do they review apps, they review latest release movies, TV shows and video games. So when your six-year-old son is telling you that Grand Theft Auto is appropriate for six-year-old boys, you pull up the app on the smartphone and it says, uh-uh, certainly not for six-year-old boys. Highly recommend these two because the app market is growing <coughs> exponentially. My five-year-old, he's now five, five-year-old announced at preschool the other day that mummy's job is playing games on her iPad. <laughs> really mortifying, especially when the teacher puts a picture up of mummy with the text underneath it. But I do spend a lot of time reviewing apps and looking for good quality apps. So what I did is pull together a list of quality apps and have published two e-books um, with the list of really good quality apps. Um, I not only give you the name of the app, 
but I give you a direct link to the App Store because the App Database, the iTunes um, App Store, is the world's worst database. You know how the latest trend is to use uppercase letters when you need lowercase and not use spaces? If you don't type it exactly the right way, it says the app doesn't exist. So I give you a direct link. I summarise what the app's about, but in the right-hand side, I give you ideas for taking learning off the iPad. Literally, what can you do after they've used the iPad? How can they play? How can they explore? We have to be really mindful that we're not using technology for the sake of it. Believe it or not, there are a lot of bubble popping, wrapping, bubble wrapping popping apps out there. Nothing beats real bubble wrap. So don't be tempted to use apps, believe it or not. You all go have a look for it. Um, with language, we know overwhelmingly TV is really positive and children can definitely benefit, but parents need to do two things in an ideal world. One of them, before you switch the TV, TV on, is to do something we call it cognitive priming. It basically means just ask your child some questions. Ask them, what are you going to watch? What do you think it will be about? It stops television from become, or them, sorry, from becoming the digital zombie. You know what I'm talking about? You could be running around in the background on fire and they would be oblivious to it because they're zombied out. So priming, ask them questions. It will help them hook what they're watching onto their real life experience. And the second thing, if possible, and I know you can't always lay down and watch play school with them, but when you can, co-view. Use television with your child. If that's not possible, the next best thing is to ask them questions after they've watched it because, again, it stops that digital zombie effect and you can connect what they're seeing on the TV with real life. So what is educational? I say look for four criteria because a lot of, if you read the, the reviews or the websites, many TV producers will tell you their show is educational. These are the four boxes you need to tick. Is it slow paced? SpongeBob SquarePants is not educational. It's too <laughs> fast paced. It needs to be very linear. It needs to have a narrative. Children do not understand stories until at least 18 months of age. So do not expect your very young infant to understand a story because they don't have the cognitive capacity. Who notices Dora says the same thing over and over again? Why does your child want to read the same book night in and night out, watch the same DVD every time? Their brain craves repetition. So look for content where the language is repeated and look for interaction. We've got really innovative technologies. It's now possible with a television and a Kinect gaming console for you to watch Sesame Street and interact in real time. So Elmo might say to you, pass eight cookies to Cookie Monster, and the child physically has to throw them and it interacts with the TV. You mightn't have that technology yet, but interaction in terms of Dora asking the children a question and getting them to respond. Again, remember, when you know better, you do better. A lot of parents are completely oblivious to this, but background <coughs> TV is really harmful for children's language development. It looks really benign, and we wouldn't think it's a problem. Background TV compromises children's <coughs> language and interferes with their play. This has really big implications at playgroups. If we've got someone that's playing something in the background, it can be really distracting for children's play. So just a simple one. We're not in use. Turn it off. Sorry, I've got a question. Please. Good question, and I go into a lot more detail on my blog about this. T uh, sorry, music is nowhere near as um, uh, disruptive because it's only one modality. The thing with music, two things with music, it has to be soft, so not loud, even if, if it's appropriate content, soft, and it has to be familiar, soft and familiar. So if the music's completely foreign to children, it's not appropriate. But there's more information on my blog, and there's quite a detailed post about that. Avoid binge watching TV unless, of course, your child's sick and we know that they often don't want to do much more than that. But this is a potentially really harmful effect. What else can we do to build kids? So we're up to the second building block and I'm aware of time, so we'll go quickly through some of these. We need to teach children to build relationships. We've got about 15 minutes? 20 minutes, good. Okay. Um, we need to build relationships. Children need to form, we all know, strong attachments to a parent or carer in the early years. Um, we've actually got research, and this research only looked at mums, so it's not excluding dads. The research has narrowed it down. What we've actually done is done brain scans, and we found that children that have warm, responsive, predictable mothers actually have a bigger hippocampus, and the hippocampus is the part of the brain that's responsible for memory. 
So literally cuddling, loving, and providing relationships for your child will boost their cognitive performance. Having said that, remember, technology can help and it can hinder. This is part of a very, very powerful advertising campaign in South Korea, and it's the idea that our screen use is potentially affecting the relationships that we have with kids. That we're sometimes really powerfully telling them that our screen time is more important than what they are. So how do we ensure that technology doesn't erode our relationships with our kids? Co-view. It's not about saying don't use technology, but it's about using it. It also means having set times. In your house and in your playgroup, you need to have tech-free zones, designated spaces where technology doesn't go, and tech-free times. And we'll come back to that a little later on. The third building block that children need, um, and that I touched on earlier, is sleep. Um, really, really important. When children sleep, much like we do, our brain basically does like a computer hard drive. It does two important functions. It prunes, so it gets rid of the neural pathways that it doesn't need. It also consolidates, so that's where we're forming memories. So it will strengthen those neural pathways that we need. If children don't get adequate sleep, we all know what we're often left with, the mess that we have to clean up, but neurologically and socially and emotionally and, and an absence or an inadequate amount of sleep is really detrimental. So how is technology interfering with children's sleep habits? And wink, wink, it's also ours. I touched on before that 90-minute period is, in an ideal world, a really special time or a really sacred time where we should be avoiding screen use, particularly tablets and smartphones with young children. And let me explain why. Your smartphone or tablet it emits blue light. Blue light stops your body from making melatonin. Melatonin is what you need to fall asleep quickly and easily. Young children need a lot more melatonin than what we do as adults. So if children are spending time with screens before sleep in that 90 minute window, their body um, doesn't produce adequate melatonin. This results in sleep delays. So it basically takes them longer to fall asleep. Over time, these sleep delays accumulate into a sleep deficit. So it might be 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Over a week, that can result in a significant sleep deficit, and a sleep deficit really adversely impacts children's capacity to learn. So what can we do apart from banning, fearing, or ignoring the technology? Obviously, if that 90-minute period isn't possible, dim the brightness on your screen. It's not emitting as much light. Increase the distance between your child and the screen. This is sometimes why TV is a better option than the iPad because one, the TV doesn't emit as much blue light and two, you don't sit as close to your TV as you do with your tablet device. So how much sleep do children actually need? Now these have recently been updated, these guidelines, last year. Um, so you can see here, very, very important that children are getting adequate amounts of sleep and that screen time isn't interfering with this. What's also really important is that bedrooms are completely tech-free zones. TVs really shouldn't be in bedrooms and gadgets should not go in bedrooms either. We're seeing increased evidence that children's sleep patterns, their sleep cycles are being interrupted because children will either get woken up by an alert or notification. So if children, older children might be playing Minecraft and they get an alert, older, much older children who are on social media and getting alerts and pings and notifications, their sleep cycles get interrupted. So you're all aware that we have five stages of sleep each night. Who remembers when you'd get woken up with a newborn baby, you'd be mid through through one of your cycles and then you'd go back to sleep. When you fall back asleep, you don't go back to the part of the sleep stage where you're at, you go right back to stage one and you start again. If kids are getting interrupted by technology, can you see how their sleep cycles are getting affected? It's often children that are waking up to go to the bathroom, which is quite normal. What do they tend to do if devices are in their bedroom? Quickly just check it one, one time. What does that do? stimulates the brain and stops them from falling asleep again. So bedrooms need to be tech-free zones. Families need to come up with a plan, as do, pre as do playgroups, about tech-free zones. Where will technology not be used? Where are these sacred places where it doesn't go? So how do you manage this at home? Have a bedtime. Some people are calling this a digital sunset. 
have a digital sunset in your house like a bedtime where devices are cut off and to facilitate this because you might have half a dozen depending on how many children a tech landing zone you can also see this I've seen this being done in some playgroups where when you come into playgroup if you've got a gadget there's a specific place a desk a, a, an area where devices go and they're plugged in at home can you see how it's really quick to do a head count of all the devices if they're there plugged in and not smuggled into bedrooms as I mentioned before, keep bedrooms as a, as a media-free space and have a landing zone. Now, I'm preaching to the converted here. Play is absolutely critical for children's neurological, social, emotional and cognitive development. Play is absolutely critical, but it is under threat because of technology. Um, and technology is changing the way children play. Children today are playing with techno toys. Has anyone been through a... a um, a catalogue from Target or Big W. I did recently, this is the researcher in me, and my husband said, what are you doing? I coded the catalogue. What percentage of toys in the Target catalogue recently were techno toys? About 85% in this one particular category. What's really concerning, whenever we look for a toy, my formula is, I love this little formula, whenever we're looking for a toy, it needs to be 90% about the child, 10% about the toy. Can you see why techno toys flip that equation? It's 90% about the technology and only 10% of what the child can do with it. That's why blocks, good old fashioned wooden blocks, are one of the best toys that you can give children. So we really wanna make sure that we don't get to a position where we see this, <laughs> really not. But again, what's the flip side? How do we get children to play with these digital toys? Because cyber play is an important part of their childhood these days. This is a really innovative new technology. So you purchase this extra kit and then you download the app for free. It's a little mirror that sits on the top of the device. And here's your traditional Tangram set. You get given a puzzle on the iPad and you have to match it. And it uses the camera to watch your response. If you position it the wrong way, you know, when your toddler gets frustrated because they can't get it right, it gives them some hints on the screen about how to perform it. So another, and I was hoping to show you this tonight, but the technology wasn't cooperating. But a really um, augmented reality is the next phase that we're going to see with children's toys. So using this particular app, you download and print out a set of flashcards that are your normal flashcards. You scan them under your device, and what comes to life? The animated character. So a 3D character pops on your iPad. It will tell you the letter name, it will tell you the sound, and the children can explore all around the animal's body. We're seeing this already. Walt Disney have released a whole range of techno toys. So now you can get your fantastic plastic aerial jewelry box, and it comes with an augmented reality app so you can bring Ariel to life in your child's playroom. So totally different ways of playing because of the technology. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Tokabocker make a brilliant range. If you're looking for an app developer that make really high quality play based apps for young children, Tokabocker would be it. This particular app stops, and I don't give this a money back guarantee, so please don't say this didn't work, but this usually prevents children from going through that stage where they want to give their siblings or themselves very elaborate haircuts. You can insert your own photo, they can insert mum or dad's photo, and they can give them the most elaborate haircut. <laughs> Now, does this mean that children shouldn't be playing with real dolls and playing hairdressers? Absolutely not. This is just another insight, another window for children's play. We have to be really mindful of the worksheet apps. Unfortunately, the app store is bombarded with apps. Interestingly, we did a study recently and we looked at just the educational apps. What percentage of educational apps are geared towards toddlers? 72%. 72%. Why? App developers are seeing this pass back effect and seeing parents hand over their devices. As a parent, do I feel better if I download something that's educational? What criteria, this is just an aside, what criteria does an app developer have to meet for an app to be educational? Not, not much, you're right. It can't contain inappropriate language and it can't contain links to inappropriate sites. If those two boxes are ticked, guess what category it can end up in? the educational category, and app developers are scrambling to get in there. So 
I touched before about the use of apps, <coughs> particularly apps that give lots of praise and rewards. So these types of letter tracing apps or know your letters, shapes, colours, very prescriptive, a bit like a worksheet. We have to use really sparingly with young children. Why? They give lots and lots of that squirts of dopamine. Good job, well done, have a badge, have a star, go to the next level. These are the apps that children can become really content or very dependent on. Remember, nothing beats real bubble wrap. I touched before about video games. They have, I've done a few studies with the New South Wales Department of Education where we're looking at the positive potential of gaming to improve learning. So there is definitely positive potential. Again, it's the content, what they're doing with the video game and who they're playing with it. A study came out a couple of months ago and we now know that 95% of Australian households have a gaming console, whether or not it's used. Who's the most, um, who's the big, where's the biggest increase in gaming users in Australia? Nope. Retirees. Retirees are using it and there's a rapid uptake because there's some research telling us it can prevent the onset of dementia and other illnesses. We're also seeing a really interesting trend that came out. Grandparents are often playing video games with their children. A lot of grandparents are buying apps for their children as well. So video games have a good, have a positive potential if the content is promoting pro-social concepts, but the flip side is if there's violent or aggressive or age-inappropriate content, it's really quite harmful. So what do we know about play in the digital age? Kids still need the cardboard box experience. Technology cannot interfere or supersede with the real cardboard box experience. The next building block is physical movement. We all know that children need to move to learn. The brain is built neurologically from a movement base. So children have to be physically active and we know that their screen time is eroding their green time. Really, really important <coughs> that children have opportunities to play outside. Teachers are really worried that children's fine motor skills are being damaged because children aren't spending time tearing, crumpling, using scissors. What are they doing? Tapping, swipe and pinching at a screen. We still need to give Play-Doh opportunities. Children still need to move and to explore. On my Facebook page, I have a screen-free brain booster every second Friday because parents were saying to me, well, what can they do if they're not using a screen? Really simple things like hanging on monkey bars and, and playing and roaming. Um, and I encourage you to share these little images with your play group. I know a lot of people send out newsletters or messages or have Facebook pages. The next thing I wanted to talk about, the next building block, the second last one, is executive function skills. This is, remember, the CEO of your brain. And there are a couple of things we need to talk about here. Your child's attention span is under threat, as is ours. We are bombarded with information. So children don't know how to manage their attention. And it is the most important thing. We have to teach our children, this is where men got it right and we got it wrong, women. It is physiologically impossible. The neuroscience confirms it. You cannot multitask. Even if you think you can, you're doing something called task switching and it results in continual partial attention. There is, we've got neurological evidence that shows there's a, a neural switch in our brain that gets flicked on and off every time we flip between tasks. So having 25 browsers open on your computer is not multitasking um, because there's, an, a, there's a cognitive cost. Um, we know that multitasking causes fatigue. Our brain uses a lot of glucose and reduce, uh, releases cortisol and adrenaline when we multitask. So we have to teach you children from a young age, I'm not going to do that, you've got to manage your attention. Do one thing. Don't have the music on playing the iPad and um, trying to do something on the computer simultaneously. So teaching children how to manage their attention how to manage their impulses is really critical in the digital age. The last thing, and I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm not going to go into detail here, but there's one thing we know consistently from the neuroscience, and that is that children, young children, need to eat a diet high in essential fatty acids. These are nuts, seeds, avocados, fish. What are children's diets often depleted of these days because of allergy risks? Nuts. Seeds, fish, really important. Now, why do they need essential fatty acids? Essential fatty acids help with a process called myelination. And myelination is a fatty substance that gets wrapped around the neural pathways. Basically, it insulates the connections. 
So if children don't have enough essential fatty acids, their brain doesn't myelinate, meaning the connections between their neurons travel a whole lot quicker. So how's technology interfering with nutrition? You might think this is a really vague thing. A couple of ways. One of them is that we know that screen time is interfering with meal time. We've got paediatric nutritionists who are telling us that children's palate is changing and taste preferences because they're not actually tasting food. They're sitting there using a screen and not focusing on the sensation of eating. We also know that children consume a lot poorer food when watching and using screens. They tend to use, uh, engage in unhealthy snacking. And we also know that children are exposed to a whole range of junk food advertising when children are using media. It's no longer just TV, it's the pop-up ad that comes up on YouTube. It's the link in the app as well. So we have to be really mindful that technology is not interfering. Okay guys, time for dinner. So really, really important that we have these tech-free zones. The dinner table, the bedroom and the playroom or play zones should really be tech-free zones. Really important children have opportunities for hands-on screen-free activities and that it doesn't supersede or replace these real important simple things that children need. Remember, it's really what we're calling ancestral parenting, simple things that children need. Uh, I'm going to come back to this one. So just to finish off, because I'm very mindful of the time, what do we need to know and be worried about with children's digital health? I'm not going to do this justice. So on my website, there are a whole lot of blogs about this, but I'm going to touch on the, just the key things that you need to at least be alert about and not necessarily alarmed. Eye posture. Children are hunched over devices for increasing amounts of times, and this is putting strains on their musculoskeletal health. What's the best posture with an iPad? lying on their tummies, keeps their neck in a neutral position, their eyes over the device, and no one likes lying on their elbows for long periods of time, so they'll get up and recalibrate their bodies. If that's not possible, a traditional bean bag works really well. Hearing, the World Health Organization estimates that five billion people, five million people, sorry, worldwide will suffer from noise-induced hearing loss in the next five years. Why? Inappropriate use of headphones couple of things with headphones. Commercial headphones reach 130 decibels, yet safe levels are 70 to 75 decibels. So what can you do? Set limits on your devices. Make sure you use earmuffs with children, not earbuds. Children will tell you they need the very expensive Bose headphones. They don't. They just need noise-cancelling earmuffs. Um, vision. Increasing rates of myopia are being seen by ophthalmologists, which is nearsightedness. So children are spending longer and earlier time with screens. So what can we do apart from banning them or fearing them? We blink about 30% less when we use a screen, so encourage your child to blink more. Also implement the 20-20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes your child uses a screen, encourage them to look at something at least 20 feet, which is 6 metres, away blink at least 20 times and get up and do something for at least 20 seconds. Wi-Fi, we need to be concerned. A lot of people are unaware that in 2011, the World Health Organization classified electromagnetic radiation that comes out of your phone and your Wi-Fi router as a type 2B possible carcinogen. I used to think these were weird scientists that, that really started to do scaremongering. I've been to conferences and I've dived into the research. My husband tells people that Christie's become a Wi-Fi warrior and warrior. Can I tell you I'm really alarmed? My biggest fear is that Wi-Fi could potentially be the asbestos or the tobacco of the 21st century. We don't yet know what the long-term implications are. And most concerningly with young children, we don't know the impact on their brain. They have a much thinner skull than what we do. They, their brain has a lot more water in it, meaning they're susceptible to environmental risks. 
So apart from moving to the country and disconnecting from the internet, what can we do? Just flick your device to airplane mode. Um, I've implemented this rule because I'm the Wi-Fi warrior that no apps in laps, literally. Children should not put, your iPad has five antenna in it and children most often put it in here. We're at a tile shop recently and my five-year-old came running out saying, mum, it's an emergency. I thought he smashed a tile. He didn't. He'd seen a little girl sitting in the waiting room with an iPad on her lap. Um, so really important. Um, when you've got a really weak signal on your phone, the worst thing you can do is the iPhone dance where you try and pick up a better signal. It's pumping out heaps of electromagnetic radiation. Send a text. Do not put the phone up to your child's head. Put it on loudspeaker. Increase the distance. Remember the blue uh, um, Ethernet cable that we all threw out when we got Wi-Fi? Find one. I had to buy one the other day. Plug back in. Flick the router off at home when it's not being used. In your workplace, there is... There might be a need, but in playgroups in particular, unless children are using devices, flick um, the, the routers off. They don't need to be exposed. So you need to come up, and what I recommend playgroups and families do, come up with a media management plan that suits your context. <coughs> Think about what they're using and when they're using it. It's not that technology is toxic or taboo. It's about how it's used, when it's used, and with whom it's used. We have to think about these sorts of questions. Because the technology, I'm going to come back to that, is here to stay. We have to teach children and ourselves how to switch off. We have to have screen-free zones and screen-free times. We really have to balance kids' green time with their screen time. Really important, neurologically as well. And we all know we learn everything from Sesame Street. <sighs> Oh, Zach? I don't know. It... Pigeons? Oh, boy! Every day I sit right there, sit and stare and check my Facebook, email, Instagram, chatting with my friends and making plans. But on days with lots of sun, I say goodbye to everyone online and say hello. I know there's a place where all bees are always buzzing about the flowers they have seen. Every tree is trending. I don't miss my little screen because I won't need a filter and the birds tweet just to say you should really take a walk on this lovely sunny day. In the park I reconnect, take some time to self. Yo, this Snapchat's gonna be crazy. No hashtag selfie. there because that song will get stuck in your head as you go to sleep tonight. Um, I have a free ebook available on my website. It's the um, Parents Essential Guide to Navigating the iPad so you can ditch your guilt and overwhelm and know what you need to be worried about. Um, it's free and it will be coming down in the next couple of months because I'm relaunching a brand new website and it won't be um, available after that. So please jump online and grab it. Um, if you feel the need, there are some contact details there. Um, my Facebook page, we have Appy Monday, Tech Tip Tuesday, Word Wednesday. Tonight I linked, and I can't wait to go home and check all the messages, to my post about um, brexting. Um, we have Tube Thursday where I share a video or something to do with technology and young children. And we finish off the week with either um, screen-free brain boosters or Friday funnies. So if you like to connect that way. I hope that I've relieved some of your, did I, techno guilt? I don't feel techno guilt, but now I feel Wi-Fi freak. Wi-Fi freak. <laughs> uh, if you are worried about that, because I know, and it's yeah. a very, can I say, there's still a lot of scientific uncertainty about it. Our federal body that's responsible for disseminating this research, PANZA, say that we need to adopt the precautionary principle. It's scary because our telecommunication companies, I hope no one works for one here, have been very clever at keeping this information very secretive 
um, but we need to adopt until I, I would um, people call my friends call me cautious Christy I'm very conservative I hope I'm proven wrong I really hope that there's nothing to be worried about but we don't yet know so on my website yeah. there's two videos and two blog posts all about Wi-Fi and electromagnetic radiation if you want to read more so go home and unplug <laughs> and I hope that was helpful Thank you.